Um, the title for this session ends on post-2015, which probably means that we should be talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm going to say just a few things about the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 <coughs> targets. Uh, we've talked a bit about, uh, about them already. Uh, I'm very concerned that these 169 targets do not have priorities identified. Uh, therefore, it seems to me it's almost everything you could imagine to put into that list, and it does worry me. Uh, what uh, my colleagues are telling me not to worry, because that means that the priorities can be set at the national level, and that may well be it. So here's uh, 169 items on the shopping list, and you decide which of these you want to, you want to buy. I have put out a few of the targets that are particularly relevant for uh, food, uh, agriculture, and nutrition. <coughs> but there are many more uh, among the 169. Eradicate extreme poverty by 2030. That's one of the targets. End hunger and food insecurity by the same year. End all forms of malnutrition. All forms of malnutrition. That includes, presumably, uh, the malnutrition that's associated with overweight and obesity and chronic diseases. To double agricultural productivity by 2030, if that target is reached, we're going to have an immense surplus of food, so hopefully we won't achieve that target. Uh, ensure sustainable food production systems by 2030. I'm not going to say very much about management of natural resources or climate change, simply because uh, I, we have a chair who says, after 20 minutes, something nasty is going to happen to you if you still stand here. And uh, the last one I pulled out was universal access to safe water and sanitation, clearly important for the <coughs> achieving the nutrition goals. What I'd like to do now is just to take a quick look at what has happened during the last 15 to 25 years in the, in the food sector, and then I'll end with a set of recommendations that I think uh, we need to look at if we are to come anywhere close to achieving these goals. And I say at least moving towards achieving those goals, whether we would achieve them or not remains to be seen. Let me go back to 2007, 2008, when we were confronted with a food crisis, and that was the end of the world as we understood it. From that point on, food prices were going to be extremely high. We we're going to run out of food at the global level. I picked this up from the internet, and, and the argument was, you see, it's already happening. Presumably, that was a supermarket that happened to close down. I don't know where the picture came from. Um, this was a good, that was a good time to write books, because books that communicate a negative message sell a lot better than books that are more positive. So the, common, the coming famine, the global food crisis. Now, fortunately, farmers didn't know about this book, so they actually produced a lot more than what was demanded during the period from uh, 05 uh, to 15, that during that 10-year period, uh, that 10 -year period uh, the world farmers increased cereal production by more than 23%. As I said, that was more than the, what was needed. So therefore, you saw a dramatic increase in the, um, in, the in cereal stock. 30, 30, more than 30% increase during that 10-year period, 10, 10 year period. If you look at China, look at the yellow line, uh, it was about 70% uh, increase. In the case of India, it was about 82% increase. At one point, a couple of years ago, India had 80 million tons of grain in stock. Now they're down to about 50. And one of the reasons they're down to 50 is a lot of the 80 million tons was lust to rot and drought, uh, not drought, rats and so on, because only half of it was on the roof. But they also managed to uh, export some of what is still good. So right now, the warehouses are full. The Thai warehouses are full of rice. The Zambian warehouses were full of maize up until recently. A lot of that was rotting as well. A few years ago, Malawi had large surpluses of maize. 
we got a lot of food sitting around uh, in the various in the various um, countries because of the let's call it oversupply prices have dropped dramatically for cereals close to 40 percent during the last three years if you look at the food price index FAO's food price index it's dropped by around 27 or so or so percent and those are recent figures those are from uh, from the most recent numbers from FAO from September uh, this this uh, month now let's look at some of the specific, uh, some of the individual cereals and what happened to the prices. And as you see the, the dramatic drop in prices during the last three years, you can see the fluctuations. This, of course, was 07, 08, when we had the so-called food crisis and close to the end of the world. Uh, immediate, it immediately dropped uh, down to here. And then in um, around 2010, 12, we had another spike. Now, the question is, when are we going to have the next spike? Is this a new trend? No, of course not. We're going to have another spike. Nobody knows when it will be. Whoever does know could, could make it really rich. If we look at the long-term trend for maize, we are actually back on the long-term trend now. If you look at that long-term trend with huge fluctuations um, in, in the past, this is from 1908. And it runs up until, with some projections from OECD, it runs up until about 2020 or so. So this projection, who knows? But anyway, we are more or less back on the long-term <coughs> downward sloping trend. That is very different from what we hear from some of the advocacy groups that say that we're going to see rapid increases in food prices uh, in the future. Um, these, uh, these are the wheat monthly prices. And again, you see the, the large decrease during the last three years. You see the, the dramatic increase in 07, 08. Uh, rice prices are slightly different, slightly different um, development since 07, 08. Uh, we didn't have a spike in 2010, 2012. Uh, there's a clear downward, downward trend as well. At this point, there was more rice globally than we ever had before. So it wasn't just a matter of uh, short supply relative to demand. There were a number of other things happening there. Let me just give you one anecdote. Roughly at the time we were here, a large quantity of rice which was stored in Japan. It was imported from the United States and the Japanese Government didn't think the consumers wanted it, so they put it in a warehouse. They had to import it because of uh, WTO regulations, and they just left it in there. There was discussion of why that rice shouldn't be released to the, global, to the world market so that these prices could begin to come down. At the end of those discussions, the United States and others agreed that that rice could be released. Ten minutes after that decision was made, the rice prices dropped. The rice was never released. That ought to tell us something about whether this was a supply issue or something else. And I wouldn't say, of course, speculation, that's such a nasty word. Now, so we have all this grain, we have all this cereal, we have dramatic drops in prices, and then we have huge losses. About one third of what's being produced is lust. Sorry, that's another loss. <laughs> so that's how many pounds we lose every year. Now, this is purely theoretical. Could it really feed two or three uh, billion people? Who knows for sure? But it's a lot of food that's being lost. Why? For probably mostly for economic reasons. It's not worth it saving it because food prices are relatively low. But it links up with infrastructure and storage and how we waste food at the uh, retail and consumption level. And, it, and, and again, the nature of the loss depends on whether you're in a low-income country and a high-income country. The HLP has just produced a report on that, which if you're interested in a detail, you can look at that. I don't have time to go into it here. So I said that's another loss. 
Uh, we have dramatic increases in overweight and obesity. There are now more overweight and obese people than there are undernourished people. The estimates vary from 1.5 billion to 2.1 billion. Nobody knows for sure, but we know that a very rapid increase is taking place uh, in overweight and obesity. I'm just showing a few of the countries, Kuwait at 43%, and that's obesity, not just overweight and obesity, that's obesity. And you can go down the list, the United States is about one third. In the United States, we have about one third obese, one third uh, overweight, but not obese, and one third that is below the body mass of 25. And when I'm really cute, I say that last third is on its way to become obese, but that of course is not true because in fact, there's a good reason to believe that overweight and obesity is on, is on a downward trend in the United States. It's particularly uh, prevalent among low-income households in the United States. That's also the case in the higher-income developing countries, whereas the low-income developing countries, you find more obesity among the high-income groups. All right, so much for the good news. Well. The bad news in the sense of, of the, the food situation is that we will be more people. And this shows the um, annual average population growth rate for three uh, periods of time. Uh, the period we're in now, the, period we, the, the past period, the period we're in now, and the future period to 2100. You see, by, by 2100, uh, the estimates show that we would be down to either zero or maybe a negative global, uh, global growth rate. How many people are, going to, are we going to be by 2050? Probably 9.3 billion. Right now, we're about 7.5. How many are we going to be by 2100? Probably about 11, 11 billion or so. Can we feed those future generations? In, in, my, in my estimate, yes, absolutely, we can. However, Look at these numbers for the increase in the middle class in Asia. This shows the billion of middle class Asians and the percent of the global middle class up until 2030. Dramatic increase in the number of people who move from lower to middle income. That is where there still is a fairly high income elasticity for food. So that's where you see the dramatic increase over and beyond what is resulting for population, for, po for population growth. Uh, this shows the purchasing power. This is just another way of showing basically the same thing. Look at the dramatic increase in purchasing power among the Asian middle class from 2009 to 2020, and that is even more dramatic as you go up to 2030. Dramatic increase in purchasing power. They want more food, and they want this kind of food. They want food of animal origin, they want uh, oils, they want, they want a more diversified diet, they want, they want less uh, grains, they want less cereals, and they want less root crops. So that's another thing we have to take into account when we talk about whether, whether the world can feed, feed future generations. Now, here's the problem. We have all this food, prices are dropping, Warehouses are full. The rats are getting fat. We have a lot of people who don't have access. We don't know how many people are food insecure because we don't have an estimate of that. Because remember, food insecurity means lack of access. And we don't know how many people don't have access to a healthy diet. But we have proxies. By the way, we have a triple burden of malnutrition, lack of dietary energy, lack of nutrient, micronutrients primarily, and um, excessive net uh, energy intake that we already talked about. This is a proxy for the calorie intake, or a proxy, if you like, for food security. But it's only a proxy because this actually measures what people supposedly are consuming or not consuming. So this is after the decision has been made to use the access to acquire food. So it's not food security, but it's probably the best we have. It comes out of FAO. It shows that uh, this is not the chair doing this to me. I'm actually doing it to myself. 
It shows a decrease of roughly 200 million people or so from the beginning of the Millennium Development Goal to the end to 2015. In 1996, FAO called a World Food Summit and the members of FAO, uh, member countries, agreed that by 2015, the um, number of uh, malnourished people, which is, uh, un yeah, and malnourished is what they call them, I believe, undernourished, what they call them, uh, should be reduced by half. Then they should have been down here. So that goal was certainly not reached. Then the Millennium Development Goal uh, was reducing by half the percentage. And, and that's much easier because populations grow. So you can actually achieve the Millennium Development Goal keeping the number of hungry people constant and having a large population increase. That's what ratios will do to you. So you see, not that very many countries managed to do that, fortunately, but you were very close to achieving the Millennium Development Goal. So 200 or so, 200 million people um, escaped undernutrition, undernourishment, according to the FAO data. <clears throat> Three-fourths of those were in China. So if you take China out of the equation, it doesn't look too good, does it? 48 million people escaped. Only 48. So it's wonderful we can hide behind the success in China. Look at Sub-Saharan Africa. There was a rather dramatic increase in the number of hungry people. Now, what are we going to do about this? I'm going to suggest three things. And I don't have time to go through the details because I already got the first sign here. First, we need to help low-income developing countries invest more in infrastructure. Infrastructure is what's holding back millions of smallholder farmers from actually escaping poverty and food insecurity. And I'm making a list of the kind of infrastructure I'm talking about, feeder roads, appropriate institutions, and that's civil society institutions, such as farmer associations, as well as public sector institutions, market information, and you can read the rest of them, uh, rest of the, on the list yourself. But unless more investment is made in infrastructure, it's not going to do a lot of good to develop more technology or to tell the farmer to be more efficient because the farmer in many of these situations is in a straight jacket, has to pay five times more for fertilizers than we do in Europe, can't sell the output. The infrastructure isn't there on either side, either side of the farm. Secondly, we need to expand public investment in agricultural research and technology particularly to get ready for climate change, because we haven't. <laughs> I told you the chair was tough. Can you give me one more minute? We are not ready to adapt to climate change. We need much more research focused on salt tolerant crop varieties, flood tolerant crop varieties, heat uh, tolerant crop varieties, and a number of other things. The fluctuations we're going to see in the future in production and therefore in prices are going to show up. We don't know how quickly the next spike is going to be there, but it's going to show up. We know that. And that's caused to a large extent by climate change. So we need better infrastructure so we can move food from surplus to deficit areas, but we also need to help farmers get ready for this new production situation that's brought about by climate change. We also need more of the research aimed at yield increases over and beyond what's caused by the climate change. One other thing that I shouldn't forget, we need to produce more nutrients per unit of land, labor, and water, more nutrients. Almost all of the world's agricultural research is focused on producing more calories. Are we getting fat? Yes, a lot of people are short on calories, and that's, it's important we get more calories at a lower price. But we need more nutrients. Two billion people are short on some micronutrient. Iron deficiency is widespread among women and children in particular. 
we need much more emphasis on expanding the production of micronutrient per unit of resource. And every time I say that to my friends in ag research, they say, we have enough to worry about without you adding something else, thank you very much. Well, biofortification, unfortunately, is one of the ways in which this can be achieved. But in the ultimate, we should have a diversified diet, and therefore we should have a diversified production portfolio. Industrial fortification, again, can help uh, particularly in urban areas. My last point, Madam Chair, and then I'm done, is that if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals, the public sector has to facilitate private sector investments. We have to stop looking at the private sector as the enemy. We have to work together, and it probably means in a sequence where the public goods have to be in place before the private sector can make money. And if the private sector can't, money, can't make money, it probably wouldn't make the investments. And I'm making a list of things that need to be done. Let me mention just one thing. Smallholder farmers have very little purchasing power to buy fertilizers improved seeds or whatever else they need. They need access to credit or they need access to savings institutions. They also need risk management tools because we are going to have these fluctuations resulting from climate change as well as government policies and speculation and whatever else comes our way. So they need better uh, risk management tools and they need a number of other things. But my main point on this is that the private and the public sector have to work together, not necessarily in a um, partnership at a particular time, but the public sector has to make sure the public goods are there so that the private sector can do its job. And with that, I thank you for your patience, Madam Chair. Thank you.